Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the tribute to Terrence McKenna event. Where is everyone tuning in from? Let us know in the chat. We have Toronto, Los Angeles, Eugene, New Zealand. Welcome, British Columbia. Hello. Castro Valley, Peru. Michigan and Baltimore. Thank you for being here. Belgium, South Carolina. Wow, we are just all around the world. Welcome everyone. Thank you to the mycelial web that connects us all. Please utilize the chat box and type in where you're tuning in from for this incredibly special event today. April 2020 marks the 20th anniversary of legendary Terrence McKenna's passing. And for the month of April, we are bringing to you the Tribute to Terrence Fireside Chat Series. And thank you for joining us for the third event in the series, honoring Terrence's personal and collective impact. My name is Danielle Nagrin. I will be your MC and host for today. I'm the Executive Director of San Francisco Psychedelic Society. And this event, this series is brought to you by the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy and the San Francisco Psychedelic Society, both nonprofit organizations. The McKenna Academy explores modern and traditional practices, ideas, and technologies that foster the understanding of nature and the cosmos. SF Psychedelic Society is devoted to the exploration of entheogens and the expansion of consciousness by providing education, community, integration, and support. So for all that are new to Crowdcast, welcome to this new platform. This is the mycelial web that's going to connect us for the day. And a quick housekeeping if you're new to Crowdcast. So please utilize the chat bar to my bottom right. Uh, feel free to comment on anything throughout the talk and build community in the chat bar. And share this event with your friends. So on mobile, there's a share button at the top of your screen. And if you're on the desktop, you can share 15 second clips from the bottom left that says clip moment. Also at the bottom below, if you click the green button, you can submit your favorites of Terrence McKenna. So if you have any images, art, videos, clips, uh, plug them in there and they will be shared on the McKenna Academy and San Francisco Psychedelic Society social media channels. So it's a great way to communicate and connect with us and uh, keep Terrence alive, as he is very much a part of our current culture. Uh, so a quick recap from last week. We started off the series viewing a never-before-seen film of Terrence McKenna at Esalen in 1989, followed by an incredible talk by our close friend D Eric Davis and uh, brother Dennis McKenna. On Saturday, we dove deep reflecting into, into the interwoven lives and lasting ripples of Terrence's impact with close friends Bruce Damer and Dr. Luis Eduardo Luna, and of course, with brother Dr. Dennis McKenna. And today, we are absolutely blessed to enjoy a one-hour fireside chat with Dr. Dennis McKenna and Dr. Paul Stamets, followed by a live Q&A. Uh, so the talk will be for about an hour and then we'll do a Q&A for a half hour. So please utilize the ask the question below me underneath the green button. It says ask a question and feel free to submit your questions there. And if you see a question that you like or that you uh, relate to, you can upvote a question and questions will be answered based on their relevance and votes. Um, after the Q&A, we're going to have breakout sessions and the breakout sessions will be moderated by San Francisco Psychedelic Society um, volunteers and team. So please check out the breakout groups, which I will explain later. And then we will have a 10 minute break and join back here at 2.20 p.m. with Dr. Wade Davis. I just wanna say a blessing to Kalindi Ailey, who passed away.
<laughs> okay, here we are. Welcome back. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, this uh, internet is exploding with over 5,000 of you. So thank you so much for your patience with the, the blackout there. Um, so I was just welcoming our guest honor uh, to, today, our host, Dr. Dennis McKenna. Can you all see me? Okay, great. Hi, we cut temporarily and now we're back. So Dennis is an incredibly accomplished ethnopharmacologist focused on the study of hallucinogenic plants. He's the principal founder of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, the founding board member at Hefter Research Institute, key organizer in Hawaska Project, and organized ESPD 50 conference. His work has been foundational in scientific exploration of ayahuasca, among many other realms. So welcome, Dennis McKenna. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. That's a, Danielle, that's a wonderful introduction. Uh, nothing like a little tech glitch at the very moment we're supposed to go on to kind of break my stride. But here we are, we're back. And uh, I am really pleased to see so many people logging on to participate in this second installment of the uh, Tribute to Terrence series. Uh, so today, it's my extreme pleasure to be able to invite two of my old friends and two who are also old friends of Terrence. This is really a treat for me to be able to appear together with these two gentlemen. Uh, they are both thought leaders and well recognized in their respective fields. So our first guest today is Dr. Paul Stamets, uh, who is practically needs no introduction to most of you. You're familiar with Paul's work. He is uh, probably one of the few people that could actually claim the title of Mr. Mushroom. He's globally known and widely respected for his work in the area of mycology, both medicinal and psychoactive uh, mushrooms. I'll read a short bibliography. This, believe it or not, is a short bibliography that I'm going to read. Paul Stamets is a speaker, an author, mycologist, medical researcher, and entrepreneur considered an intellectual and industry leader in fungi, their habitats, medicinal uses, and production. He lectures extensively to deepen the understanding and respect for the organisms that literally exist under every footstep taken on this path of life. Paul's philosophy is that mycodiversity is biosecurity. He sees the ancient old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest as a resource of incalculable value, especially in terms of its fungal genome. His research is considered breakthrough by thought leaders for creating a paradigm shift for helping ecosystems worldwide. He's author of six books, including Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms and Psilocybe or Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World. He has discovered and named four new species of psilocybin mushrooms. He's the founder and owner of Fungi Perfecti LLC, makers of the host defense mushroom nutraceutical supplement. Paul, welcome to our forum. It's lovely to see you. Honored to be here. Hey, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. So we have an hour and we can talk about whatever we want. Um, you know, I have some talking points, but uh, tell me a little bit about your relationship with Terrence. Well, first off, I'm in a remote island in British Columbia. I um, came up here expecting to only be up here for two weeks. I have a cabin up here and then they closed the border. So, um, <laughs> I decided this was a really great place to get a lot of writing done and research, and so I'm telecommuting. Um, well, I met, you know, I really met both you and and Terrence uh, through the Austin Eric Psilocybin Mushroom Magic Mushroom Growers Guide, 
I'm not sure which one was Austin, which one was Eric. Um, I'm Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just clear that up right now. I'm Eric. <laughs> okay. well, I, I've always wondered how you came up with those two names, Austin and Eric. There's a story. I can, ex I can explain if you want. Yeah, I would love to hear it because it's first for me, so it may be first for many people. Okay, so, well, just, well, uh, I, I can. I mean, I can credit Terence with uh, with the names. He came up with the names. O N Eric is derived from the word oniric, which means dreams or having to do with dreams, and O T O S means is derived from odios which means far removed or far away. So dreams from far away, that is a basic idea. And of course, at that time we were, you know, at least Terence was touting the notion that mushrooms were extraterrestrial. Uh, it's a romantic idea, I think as a mycologist and a, uh, uh, um, you know, a biologist, I think you and I both agree that sadly they are not extraterrestrial, they are not, messengers from alien civilizations or alien planets they're messengers they're terrestrial they're definitely terrestrial and their message is is terrestrial but that's how uh that's how they came up with the name and i remember i think the first time that you and i interacted uh, a lot was at the uh telluride wild mushroom conference i think the first time I was invited, it was 1980 or 1981, uh, and we had a wonderful dialogue because I think the book, had, my book, Our Magic Mushroom Growers Guide had come out just about then or fairly recently, and you were in the audience and I was talking, and I think I was making a lot of statements uh, and probably which were, you know, not true, but I was bouncing everything to you and say, do you agree with this, Paul? Is that correct, Paul? <laughs> so it was really a, it was really a sweet conversation. And then, and then I did give a talk at the, at the mushroom conference about um, how psilocybin maybe was important in the origin of consciousness. I think it was a little bit too edgy for most of the audience, and I wasn't invited back until 2017. <laughs> so, so it so it goes, you know. <laughs> I, I doubt it was too edgy, but I, uh, to defend Terence, that uh, you know, spores can be extra extraterrestrial. Uh, Psilocybe cubensis, the most popular uh, psilocybin mushroom grown in the world, is producing enormous amounts of spore mass on this planet going out into outer space. So it is, the spores are going extraterrestrially away from the earth, you know, the mothership um, in, in the, into the cosmos. So Terrence had it right. He just had it backwards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like so many things, right? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's but right. The Definitely uh, those spores are getting out into the cosmos, but their origin is, is the earth, you know. Well, let me give a little bit of perspective for people in the audience. As, um, to, so the Austin Eric book was uh, phenomenally uh, important uh, for what I call the Slossoby Cubensis Scholarship Fund, uh, practiced throughout colleges in Europe and North America in particular. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it showed people how to grow um, psilocybe mushrooms on grain in jars in their closets, you know, very uh, mid-tech, but very um, low-level production. So many, many college students, many professors, many people of significance, I would say, have confessed to me after I've used the phrase, the Slosby Cubensis Scholarship Fund, that they too, you know, uh, pay their tuition uh, through that fund um, in their dormitories, et cetera. So it was a major movement. There was a, a psilocybin mushroom uh, interest and in, exploded in the 1970s. And you and Terrence were very much a part of that. And um, the beautiful photographs by Jeremy Bigwood really uh, made that book stand out. Uh, not only his content, but Jeremy's beautiful photographs of the, the blue background. So that really made it, it made it sort of noticeable on the bookshelf, you know. Um, and I greatly right. admire his skill in photography. So that was in the mid 1970s. I was a um, little background. My brother John went to Yale and. Um, and I was the youngest one of my family. He's my oldest brother, so he was my mentor. And I love my brother John. Um, you know, your Terrence has passed. My brother John has passed. So, you know, our two brothers, who are hugely important in our lives, have moved on, and their influence on us continues. And I 
think about my brother John virtually every day, but he was a psychonaut and we spent, we tripped a few times together and came up with the phrase, the family that trips together stays together. So <laughs> I guess that's better than the family that trips together flips together or something <laughs> like that. Well, that happens. Too. When, when did, uh, when did your brother uh, pass on Paul? He uh, died in 2014. Um, okay. So but, he, he lived much longer than Terrence and was he your older brother? My older, my oldest brother. Yeah. So, okay. Um, John, my condolences. Well, John went to Yale, then he got a full scholarship in neurophysiology at the University of Washington Medical School. And so he came out to Seattle. A bunch of his Yale buddies came out at a house in North Seattle. I was a logger hippie in the mountains, uh, but I would come down to Seattle to go into the, the reference library at the University of Washington in the science the science library in the basement. And I and looking for anything on psilocybin mushrooms. And virtually 90% of the books that I found had been razored out. The page, you probably remember, <laughs> the pages have been ripped out because people were so desperate for information. So it's very difficult. And I was self-taught and I joined the Pacific Northwest Key Council, a taxonomic group that wrote taxonomic keys. And so I started writing taxonomic keys on the genus Psilocybe, the major genus that holds most of the psilocybin mushrooms. And there were later genera in the Stropheriaceae family. This is Hypholoma, Nematoloma, and Stropheria. It used to be called Stropheria cubensis. Right. Stropheria means sword belt, or you know, a belt on a sword. Um, and so it got moved to the genus Psilocybe. So I knew there was a cluster of taxonomically of species close together. And so I got, got under the wing of Dr. Daniel Stuntz, of the University of Washington, and the Pacific Northwest Key Council, the only long-haired hippie in the group. Um, lots of elderly people who took an affection to the fact that a young person, albeit his interest was a little strange, but they, <laughs> they brought me under their wing. And um, I spent many, many nights at the University of Washington uh, Key Council with Dr. Daniel Stuntz, and he opened up his library to me. So when I, he opened his library, all those books that I was trying to get access to, he had them preserved. And I, 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 we haven't talked about this, but no. simultaneously, you and Terrence are spending a lot of time at the Fitzhugh Ludlow Library. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. Right. So and that was thing. back when the Fitzhugh Ludlow Library had a space, in the, I think, in the hate someplace. Now it's it's not clear where it is. It's it's virtual. But yes, he was good friends with Michael Horowitz, uh, who was the curator of that library, and who actually moved to Vancouver a few years ago. I haven't seen him since I moved here. But yeah, that that's right. That was that that was that connection. So there were, there were two sort of meccas in terms of libraries that were intact. Uh, that had and Harvard would be another one. Um, Yale not so much. But those three libraries were were according were were magnets for us who were interested in finding this information because so much of the libraries have been basically the pe people had ripped off the books, et cetera. And so my focus was that. And then I heard about Terrence and your work, you know, through the grapevine. And then this individual, this character that we both know, an interesting character named Jeremy Bigwood, came up to the Soul Simon State College. I mean, the Evergreen State College. I'm sorry, I renamed it. Freudian slip on purpose. Um, right. And what had happened is Dr. Michael Bug, my professor, um, had been called in to testify in the in defense of individuals who had collected psilocybin mushrooms and been busted by law enforcement. Because he was an organic chemist, he very quickly could see that the government's analytical methods were flawed and they were pulling out all sorts of other tryptamines, but not specifically psilocybin. Um, <laughs> He kept getting their cases thrown out of court because he was an expert witness. And then Michael went on to write the analytical method that was accurate. And so Michael saw an interesting opportunity to saying, well, I could get a DEA license. And so Michael applied for a DEA license and put my, my name on it, as well as Jeremy Bigwood. So we were fully covered by a drug enforcement tracing license for all of our research, which Cause I was, it, it sounds great, at, you know, initially, but it made, we were paranoid anyhow, right? We were, we were constantly paranoid. And so that meant every single person who came up to me with an interest in psilocybin mushrooms, I de facto, you know, by, by default, I thought, 
a lot of them are DEA agents, you know, trying to trying to trick me. So I came right. up, I came up with a motto, which I still follow: Nature provides, I don't. So I've drawn that line in the stand, sand. Has kept me very safe. I can write about it. I can speak about it. I can write books about it. Um, but nature provides, Sam does not. Okay. So just to make that clear to the, the 5,598 people who are listening. <laughs> All you DEA, DEA uh, agents out there listening, I think the message is if you want mushrooms, don't go to Paul. Right? Yeah. Happy to dispense information. And, and this is, this is what we have to do, you know, and, and actually ethics requires that, uh, you know, uh, mushrooms are easy enough to find in the wild. It takes a little bit of education and some library research. You could start actually with Paul's book, one of your landmark books. And then among the many that you've written is psilocybin mushrooms of the world. And it has some of the best photographic uh, photography of, of psilocybin mushrooms I've ever seen, including beautiful electron micrographs of spores and this kind of thing. And that's all work you did in, in uh, um, Michael Bugue's lab. Right. So you, you guys created a little nest of basically radical mycologists here. You know, it was the, it was the, the, I would say the seed, but maybe more appropriately, I should call it the spore of this movement. I mean, you did some very basic research in that lab that eventually found its way into the world, like the analytical methods and so on. So you created a little, uh, not so little, it turns out. You created a revolution in was, that lab at Evergreen State. It was more It was more than just me, of course. It was a core group of people. The, the bizarre thing is uh, Jonathan Ott was there uh, with Michael Bugue also. And he's many. He's a well-known psychonaut written a dozen books. And Jonathan right. went to study with Gaston Guzman in Mexico City, who wrote the monograph on the genus Psilocybe. And then... I came into the laboratory, and then a year later or so, Jeremy came into the laboratory. Um, so Michael Bugue's um, center there uh, populated or spawned or whatever you want to call it, three of us in particular who went on to collectively, I think I, we wrote 20 books. And Michael Bugue is just is a dear, lovable, uh, lovable professor. He's the type of pr professor I think all of us aspire to have, someone who's kind and genuine, who's humorous. And he never shamed me. And I think this is so important. He never shamed someone who knew, knew less than him. He, they in, enjoyed laughter and engagement, uh, poking fun at you, but not in a mean way, not in a way that is demeaning, but in a way to, to, to engage you in the excitement of conversation. And so I have an enormous debt of gratitude to him because he's one of the kindest people I've ever met in my life. And I'm so honored to be one of his students. So. So there's a lot of really interesting things that were happening in the mid 1970s. And so Jeremy came up uh, from the Fitzhugh Ludlow Library and came to Evergreen. There is Dr. Stephen Pollock, who is in San Antonio, Texas. And mm -hmm. at one point, those all, Jonathan, Jeremy, Stephen Pollock, even Terrence were all friends. And then it became highly politicized, very big egos involved, lots of competition. Jonathan's sort of mantra was he wanted to write the history. He wanted to be the person who wrote the history. A eh, um, little bit of concern about that. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, but, but I could see why. <laughs> he's an intellectual giant. He's an absolute, you know, 10 times smarter than I am. Um, and then Art Gordon Wasson came to visit. And then Albert Hofmann came to visit the Evergreen State College. And then we did the, uh, we decided, uh, Preston Wheaton, myself, uh, Jonathan Ott, um, decided to create the first psychoactive mushroom conference in 1976. Now, this is bizarre, you know, because we had all these professors from the University of Washington and elsewhere. We invited them to this conference, but we wouldn't tell anybody where the conference was. So <laughs> probably a good idea, right? <laughs> we didn't have internet back then, right? So yeah. we immediately had 125 people sign up and they came to the Evergreen State College and they were told to basically bring a sleeping bag and a backpack and we would not disclose where the location was. So at the appropriate time, they showed up 
you know, at Red Square, they have Wednesday College, the, the front campus, and we had rented buses. And so 125 psychonauts, not knowing where they're going, trust us. <laughs> then we drove them about 25 miles away to Miller Sylvania State Park. And we had to do a lot of background stuff on the Miller Sylvania State Park to, to allow us to have a conference. So, um, but, and I like to record this for the sake of history because I don't want people to forget this, is that on the opening night of the conference, which was at nine o'clock was the first talk, which was mine, the intros began at eight o'clock. Well, <laughs> word got out, and R. Gordon Wasson was there, Jonathan Ott, myself. I had a little bit of a falling out with that group. I think it was a money grab, I don't really know. But they said, listen, Paul, you start the conference. And they were not there. We have 125 people getting restless. It's 8.15, 8.30. Where is everybody? The sponsor, you know, I'm, I was kind of put out the pasture, but I'm now leading the first speaker. And so right. I, I got a note. And, and they said, go ahead and start the conference, Paul. And the word had gone out that the DEA was going to bust the conference. So they, uh... they put me up on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul, we're not coming to our own conference. And I'm going, WTF, dudes. Uh, <laughs> right. so, so I'm there. I'm like super paranoid, and I have to give my opening talk. And, uh, of course, the conference did not get busted. And then Jonathan and, and Jeremy and R. Gordon Wasson showed up the next day. So let this be recorded in history. Um, so anyhow, the conference was a wild success. David Repke was there, Dale Leslie. Uh, the next year, Gaston Guzman came. Um, Daniel Stuntz was there that we named, that was uh, Jonathan Ott co-authored with Dr. Gaston Guzman, Slosby Stuncia. Now what had happened, and this is quite remarkable, um, the, in the Pacific Northwest, um, the mycologists did not even know what psilocybin mushrooms looked like because it wasn't until the advent of beauty bark and wood chips around buildings, uh, uh -huh. that the psilocybin mushrooms literally came out of the, out of, out of the forest. And it's still to the day, we think there may be endophytes, many of them existing inside of a tree. And only when the tree, tree is chipped up, then the mycelium then rebirths and the mushrooms form. But Psilocybe sinescens, um, Psilocybe baocystis, Psilocybe stuncii, um, many of these psilocybin mushrooms that are wood chip growers had never been seen by mycologists who've been studying mushrooms for 40 or 50 years. It's uh -huh. only the invention of beauty bark. And so suddenly, all these psilocybin mushrooms started come up, coming up around universities, around courthouses, around law enforcement facilities. <laughs> the biggest mushroom patch I've ever seen was in front of the Boat Street patch. It right. was in Washington, in front of a police station. Right. And, uh, and so it was just a phenomenal surge. And so Dr. Daniel Stuntz was getting all these psilocybin mushrooms going, I've never seen these. And then he realized that they had not been named. And so uh -huh. in honor of Dan Daniel Stuntz, Jonathan Otten, Gaston Guzman, named this unknown species from the University of Washington campus after Dan Daniel Stuntz. It was going to be called Slosby pugitensis for growing in the Puget Sound area. And then the name became Slosby stuntsii. So that was so the you, you named it? No. Slosby no. stuntsii? Or who, who yeah, named Gaston, it? That? Gaston Guzman and, okay. and Jonathan Otten. Yeah. yeah. The co-author yeah. of that species. Boy, it's it's so interesting to hear you reel off these old names. I mean, this is incredible. You know, David Repke, uh, Dale, um, I can't even remember his name, but all of these names resonate with me in memory to the extent yeah. I have a memory left, you know. Gary uh, Mentor, uh, you know, was also a, a big, really important person. He was a, he was a competitor to me, uh, but he was one of the nicest competitors I've ever met. And... Yeah. Um, Gary Dale Leslie, yeah, he was. Yeah, he did a lot of work on the chemistry, as I recall. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I wanted to the, just as an aside. It's in, you mentioned the book, and Jeremy Bigwood was the uh, was the photographer for the book, and his color photographs, the color in, inserts, were quite beautiful and stunning. And and of course, the cover of the book had 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 his photograph on the cover, which got a lot of people's attention. But his black and white photographs that showed how to do it were, by and large, very small, kind of 
not great photography, you know. I mean, it, it there was enough information there to show how to do it. But I always was amused by the fact that Jeremy uh, chose for his uh, pseudonym on the book, he called himself Irimaeus the Obscure. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to kid him, Jeremy, is that a reference to your photographs here? <laughs> because they're not very clear. <laughs> and of course, he denied that. But yeah, he's. Uh, we also get, I have to give credit to Kat Harrison. Okay, Kathleen Harrison was also, you know, part of the four of you, and and she yes. did a lot of the illustrations too. So big shout out to her. So yeah, yeah, she did the illustrations. Uh, did a beautiful job. In fact, I have one of her original drawings on my, on my wall right here. I'll I'll show it to you if I can reach it without unplugging something. Let me see. Um, Oh yeah, excellent. Well, look at yeah. this, and look at this. Aww. Yeah, Aww. this is a, a gift that Kat made uh, many years ago, and she drew this now, when she and Terrence were staying in Hawaii together. This is great because, see, this is a replica mushroom stone, a Mesoamerican mushroom stone from the Maya culture, the pre-classic and classic period, 500 BCE to 500 AD. But this is the only mushroom stone that I know of a woman warrior. A woman warrior. She's got this skirt around, and so mm -hmm. most of them are male figures or animal figures, lizards, toads, etc. But this is the one that currently is the original is in Zurich, Switzerland, in the museum there. But this is the one, and so it's my favorite mushroom stone. So Cat Harrison drawing that one. She also had that same attraction to this very unusual unusual mushroom stone. But let me, for historical purposes, and I hope there are some psychonautic historians out there. And you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm I'm as deeply into this. Um, in 1957, Alexander Smith and Rolf Singer published a, a, a monograph on the genus Psilocybe. Uh -huh. And Roger M. and R. Gordon Wasson spent a lot of time with um, Don Pablo Ross Rico, I think, or something like that. Um, yes. And so he was really accredited with one of the first ones who were who who brought out this knowledge to Western science, uh, the, the Q and Darrow has been published, uh, practiced for thousands of years. So, you know, we were, we were pretty much out, outsiders to this knowledge. Right. But this monograph was published and apparently it was published, I think about three months or maybe only two months before the Les Champagnes and Lucien du Mexique was published, which was the Roger M. Uh, and R. Gordon Wasson's, you know, massive work. Yeah. Monograph Mass on the Mexican, uh, Psilocybes, yes. And because of the international rules of nomenclature, whoever publishes in a peer-reviewed journal first, with a Latin description typically, uh, their names take precedence. So this created a huge divide. And uh, it basically became a, a war between the academic mycologists uh, in France versus the United States. Uh, Rolf Singer and Alexander Smith. Alexander Smith is considered the father of American mycology, University of Michigan. Rolf Singer was a great taxonomist. But um, to two points I want to make. Um, in the second part of their monograph, they show how to grow Psilocybe cubensis on grain. There's a complete uh -huh. description. On uh -huh. how, so I suspect that's where Terrence and you may have seen that part of the monograph and the techniques for growing Psilocybe cubensis on grain. No, that's not where we saw it. I'll I'll tell you where we saw it. Where, where did you see it? Uh, I saw it. There was an article, a paper in Mycologia, which is a journal, right. peer-reviewed journal. Every mycologist knows what Mycologia was. Came out about 1974, and it was a it was a paper about how to grow mushrooms on grain in in mason jars exactly the technique that we use except the uh the person that wrote it uh, i forget his name it was a funny it was a funny name and i forget the name but it was it was a technique that he had published for mycologists who wanted to do genetic research you know on mushrooms they could grow small amounts it was applied to the common edible mushroom agaricus bisporus 
and I got this paper and well, we had mushrooms in, you know, in mycelia, we had plates and all that. Our attempts to grow liquid culture had been dismal failures. So just on a hunch, I thought, well, let's try this, you know, and as it happened, uh, you know, I happened to be at the uh, Colorado State University. I'd already gotten my degree, but I'd gone down, gone back to Colorado State to get some more, to get organic chemistry and more taxonomy. And this uh, on the recommendation of Schultes, because I was trying to get into graduate school at, <clears throat> at Harvard to work under Schultes. And, and he and I actually made a pilgrimage out there, which I described in my book, to meet the great man. Schultes was incredibly kind to me and I think to everybody, you know, that crossed his path because he loved students. You know, you mentioned a few minutes ago about mentors. And I think for you and for me as well, mentors are far more important than the institution you study in. No, you know, I mean, I got my master's at the University of Hawaii, you know, and then my PhD at UBC. But, you know, University of Hawaii, nice place, but not top tier academic institution. But my mentor there, Dr. Sandy Siegel, who then introduced me to Neil Towers, another amazing mentor, you know, he was one of the most out of box thinkers I've ever run into. You know, he was an environmental toxicologist and, and uh, he, his, his Balawick, his specialty was stress physiology. So he studied organisms that lived in volcanic vents and this kind of thing. And he was just, you know, I can't tell you how much I owe to those two gentlemen, Neil Towers and, uh, and Sandy Siegel. Um, now, as a postdoc, I had some other mentors who were like, you know, the supervisors from hell, but we, we don't need to go into that. But these two mentors, and so it's really affected my own mindset in the sense that I feel it's important to uh, be receptive to students, you know, and encourage them to go for what they're interested in. And, uh, you know, this is really one of the most gratifying experiences I have. And I think you too, Paul, you're a, you're a great teacher. And I love teaching. And, and this is the whole thing about the McKenna Academy is to have it be a place of education where people can come and even if they have crazy ideas, you know, and lots of us do, you know, they'll be respected, they'll be heard, not necessarily believed, but they'll get a hearing. And, and this opening this thing up as a forum for ideas is, is the whole motivation, you know, and I really appreciate your support for the Academy and everything you've done well, just well, in general. So well, uh, 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 Terrence uh, frequently uh, referred to you as uh, my brother's a real scientist. I'm not. <laughs> he well, commonly that's true. Actually, <laughs> that's true. I mean, he, 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 you know, he knew science, but he, he didn't study it. And sometimes I, you know, I, I've listened to lectures and so on that he's given most recently the video. But the point is, I mean, he wasn't a detail person. He was an ideal. He was an idea person. So maybe he named one of the constituents of ayahuasca incorrectly. But so what? The point is, his ideas were valid. And that's that's very interesting. Let well, me ask you, we're kind of drifting away from Terrence, but I wanted to ask you, um, well, when, so this, this, this conference that you described to me, this first conference, he was not there. No, right. uh, Schultes and Wasson was at the second uh, uh, was at the second conference. Um, so there's a 1976, 1977. Then we began a series of Mycomedia conferences that I put on with my two other partners, and then Terence came to one of those at, at Brighton Bush Hot Springs. Right, um, and that's where Terence and I really first spent a lot of time with each other. And um, what I enjoyed about Terence is he would laugh at himself. He would laugh at his own mistakes, and he this had a is important. sense of humor. Um, yeah, he was wrong, and he would emphatically defend himself. But at some points, you know, he also would just give up. And he goes, "You know, I'm totally wrong." And I, 
<laughs> I, wish our, I wish our president could learn that that trait, well, you know. <laughs> his cost of the time wave to zero. You know, he had the end of time um, being, uh, being on his birthday. And I got, okay, you know, let, let's talk about this, right? Right, right. <laughs> His time wave zero was a, was an algorithm that constantly adjusted to current events. And so it was a self-correcting algorithm. Well, that's that's good for algorithms are self-correcting, but is a time wave zero thing is something that frankly I never, never got behind. But I do want to give credit, and I do think it's plausible, and I've stated this many times. Your stoned ape theory, which I call a hypothesis, is becoming a theory because now we're seeing that psilocybin and psilocybin analogs do cause neurogenesis. We do say that they have a profound lasting effects, making people uh -huh. better, better citizens, healthier, better partners, a reduction in partner to partner violence, um, more empathy, um, being able to face the end of life. Um, so you and the, the, the now we are our research. We're not going using psilocybin. We're using legal psilocybin analogs. We've been spiking these um, into uh, pluripotent stem cells. Uh, these are basically stem cells that differentiate into neurons. And we have done like five ex sets of experiments now, and we have shown that these psilocybin analog, which are probably illegal, and we know that psilocybin does the same thing as, from other people's research, stimul uh -huh. stimulates neurogenesis, causes new neurons to form, to proliferate, to fork, causes remyelination on the axons. And so you, you two are way ahead of your time. One of these stone journeys that you went on came to, I think, an empathic truth. There are some things that you hear, and over the body of evidence that has accumulated in the past 40 years, um, I think you and Terrence have came upon something that is truly profound. And I think it's it, it will be increasing evidence over time will further support this not being a hypothesis, but being a truly a, a well-founded theory. Yeah, it's, I mean, the stone ape theory is something that is, it's very easy just to dismiss it out of hand, you know, which is what most people have done. Well, the very idea, we got smart by eating mushrooms, you know, that's absurd. Don't bother me with that. That was never the argument, you know, and, and people that want to oversimplify the idea so that they can dismiss it, I feel sorry for them because like you, I feel that there is a core of truth there. We don't know how far back in evolutionary history, the history of our species, that people, hominids, even people that were not yet human in the sense they weren't homo sapiens, they had to stumble across mushrooms in these environments, these savanna environments that they were inhabiting. And, and Celasmi cubensis is a perfect example. I mean, it's not a shrinking violet type mushroom. You know, it's big, it's robust, it's yellow and purple. You can't not notice it, you know, if you're walking through a pasture, especially if you're looking for something to eat. Right. You know, so it's naturally people would have eat it, eaten it. And then I think... I mean, Terence had various reasons for uh, arguing for the stoned ape hypothesis, and, and I had also a different take on it. But my take was it enabled us to have to interiorize ideas, essentially, to, uh, to create abstractions that were meaningful, that were linked to language and image that were actually the basis of of ideas that enabled it enabled early hominids to form complete idea complexes and and this is what we do as humans i don't think that there are other i don't think that animals by and large create essentially models of reality and that's what we do that's the whole thing that we do <laughs> everything we do is an attempt to reflect our you know the models we construct reflect the world we live in in an well, abstract way. When I Mushrooms looked, gave us that talent, I think. When, when I started exploring, you know, whether this is a credible hypothesis or theory, I uh, came across research that 22 primates consume mushrooms. 22, 23 with humans. That speaks to a long ancest ancestry of primates having encounter with fungi, knowing which ones are edible, which ones to avoid, which ones to seek out. So right. when you see that, uh, 23 primates have a history of consuming mushrooms. The Golgi mon monkey of Bolivian Amazonia consumes more than 12 times its body weight per year. 
so when you consider that, and then as climate change occurred, the Stone Age uh, theory uh, postulates that you know our climate ancestors go across the savanna, tracking animals, looking at uh, ungulates primarily. You look for footsteps and scat, poop. Right. And, and right. You run this last week, you you're hungry. You know, you eat it, you share it with your loved ones, and suddenly you have this voyage that's extraordinarily powerful and meaningful. And I believe psilocybin makes nicer people. And we need- I think there's people. good evidence that it does. Yeah, we, I mean, we, it, need, it, we need leaders who are courageous and kind. Where are those leaders today? You know, you want to follow a leader that you can trust, who is strong and courageous, but also has the interests of the commons foremost in their mind, not their own personal interests. And I think that the psilocybin mushrooms will lead at a time that we need to have a revolution for the freedom of consciousness. I think this COVID-19 period that we're in could be our time for this paradigm shift, where we can reinvent and reprioritize the values that we used to aspire to, you know, as peoples and unified and a common mission. And now with technology and money and capitalism and loss of biodiversity, you know, this narrative has been hijacked by highly moneyed interests who do not have the commons in mind. So I think this is the time for us to, to truly do a, 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 recent, a reset on consciousness. And I'm hoping that this worldwide movement will be it, it will propel us into that future. Yes, I, I agree. I think in that sense, I think that COVID is, is a kind of a gift, you know, from nature. It could have been much worse. It could be much worse. It's bad enough, but I think nature is sending a message. Here is an opportunity for learning. You know, if you listen to this and reflect on it and then reflect on our place, you know, we have to re my whole shtick is I talk about the fact that we become alienated from nature. And this stems out of the notion that we think we own nature. We think it's here to, you know, for us to serve and exploit and ultimately rape. This is a message from nature saying, Hey, you monkeys, this is just a gentle tap on the wrist to remind you that you're not running things. You know, you're part of nature. You have to learn to live within the constraints of nature because as a species, we're destabilizing all the mechanisms of equilibrium that sustain life on Earth. You know, uh, I, I wanted to, since you mentioned COVID and, and you know, when Terence passed on in 2000, so many things that we, you know, it seems like another world. It, it's another century, but so many things that have happened since that Terence never witnessed. I don't know if he anticipated, you know, 9-11, the financial collapse, the wars in the Middle East, uh, you know, um, advances like the YouTube and the iPhone, social media. What do you think Terence would have made? Uh, what would he have had to say about our current existential historical situation? Well, I mean, it'd be dangerous <laughs> for me to speculate, but I, I think this, um, the fact of the, um, he was aware of the com computer internet. It was just, you know, getting more and more robust, you know, just before his death. I think this seeing the interconnectedness of nature is of a, was a, is the paramount message that we get when we journey on high doses of psilocybin. So yeah. I think I think the interconnectedness of consciousness that we're doing right now, um, you know, on this platform with people all over the world. There are people from Russia right now and and from New Zealand, from all over Europe. Uh, this is the collective consciousness of being. And I think uh, Terence would see this as a fulfillment of his pioneering work. Uh, this is an extension of it. So I think he would have a great gratitude and in, in, in a sense that um, we are be and now more interconnected as a community. I think also um, he would be horrified um, at the at the 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 track that we have been on uh, that has um, gone away from indigenous knowledge, the respect for biodiversity. The respect for the ecosystem and this short-term gain that people play in, in order to get money at the long-term expense of the commons i think is a, a debt of nature that we have to pay and that's what i think these we, this is the beginning of viral storms i've been talking about this for over 20 years and many virologists 
uh, Larry Brilliant, many, uh, Bill Gates, lots of people have talked about why haven't we had one sooner of this magnitude? And this is the sad and difficult news for many people to understand because now we have hundreds of millions of people being reservoirs for, for COVID-19. Um, you can have more than one virus simultaneously. And right. so the ex exchange of genetic material, most of these viruses dilute out in their pathogenicity, not all of them do, but we could be in a continuous period of viral storms, one after another. Mm -hmm. And so time for us to brace for impact. This is a wake up call for us to reinvest in biodiversity um, look at the look at all the air pollution that's gone away. I mean, mm -hmm. the talk could be seen, you know, with blue skies. Beijing is as clear skies. You know, this is good for us to see that we are having such an impact on the ecosystem that when we stop our activities, the nature recovers quickly. So I believe in the resilience of nature, but I hope we have this as a deep lesson that we are influencing the ecosystem dangerously with our pollution and our expansion and the out of control human population explosion. It is time for us to really start reinvesting in the biodiversity of nature. And that's so why I think the fungi and these mushrooms open up the mind's eye to the, the importance, the gestalt of, of our existence uh, in this reality. You know, nature is, is our mother, we should take care of her. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it seems like it, it's an obvious lesson, but it's one that we easily forget. And that the, it's interesting. I mean, as a species, we have such a short memory. You know, uh, who remembers the 2018 or the, the 1918 to 1920 influenza epidemic? You know, many of the lessons that we're relearning were learned then. And you know, we just don't seem to be able to integrate these lessons of history and change our behavior, you know, which is disturbing. I, I think that you're absolutely right. You know, we, I mean, Terence was, whether or not his ideas about the time wave were correct, I think that he was right on the money when he predicted that there is going to be a huge shift, an existential shift for the species and the planet. We're living through it now. We're seeing this now. He was not correct in the particulars, but he was, you know, he got the year wrong. He got lots of things wrong. But basically the idea of a singularity or a, a tremendous uh, existential shift in the way that we have to live in this world if we're going to continue he was right on the money with that so in a sense i think he would look around and, and at what's happening he would probably be dismayed a lot of us can be dismayed at what's happening he would also but he would not be surprised you know mm -hmm. he was talking about this from the late 80s and we've all seen it coming you know, we can look back, we can say, oh, the environmental crisis and the climate change, all this, if only we'd started to do something about it 30 years ago, we wouldn't have this problem or we'd be much more on top of it. We're not very good at anticipating the future and planning for it. This, this disturbs me. This may, be, this may be what eventually kills us as a species. You know, yeah, well, we can't we can't think ahead. Well, Neil Young wrote songs on this that were popular predicting this, you know, so it's part and part of a gestalt of a sort of a, a subculture of us that we're more, we're treated as if we were kind of the left environmentalists that were pot smoking hippies who didn't have a clue. Well, right. Sure, pot smoking hippies created the Internet. You know, they are now populated <laughs> some of the best universities throughout the world, and they are really taking their responsibility for making this environment a better place for future generations quite seriously. And it's very interesting to me, and I speak this in, in the movie that we were both in, Fantastic Fungi by Louis, Louis Schwartzberg, is it's interesting to me, irrespective, there it is, a plug. <laughs> brother, it is. He didn't yeah. ask me to show it, I just had it handy. I wanted fantastic, fantastic fun. piece of work, Paul, just, just yeah. incredible. Fantasticpunch.com, yeah. uh, April 21st, there'll be a, another session like this on the movie. But irrespective of whether shamans uh, saw uh, illness as caused by uh, in the in spirits in the invisible 
or whether it's caused by uh, scientists would look at it as be caused by microbes or viruses. They share it in common that disease states can be caused by something in uh, that can't be seen. Uh, and I think that the in First Nations and especially in North America, the concept of seven generations is such a wise lesson that we need to learn. What is your effect seven generations from now? Right. You, you have a responsibility for your to your descendants. And, and 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 even in the Bible, I grew up in a Christian environment. You're supposed to leave the environment in a better place than you than you inherited it, and you know take care of your body as your home. Well, that's or the ecosystem. So it seems to me that we have some really poignant lessons uh, to learn from indigenous peoples and those of us from, from European descent. The Eleusinian mysteries, two thousand years ago, uh, for over a thousand years in Greek time. Uh, thousands of uh, Greek citizens across all cultural strata would walk, you know, a dozen plus miles, heckled along the way to a great Celestrian, uh, a temple with pillars, and they all imbibed in a, in a fungal mixture, you know, Plato, uh -huh. Sophocles, uh -huh. and Otto. And so it's not just Mesoamerican and South American and North American indigenous people, it's European indigenous people. So this is the bridge of consciousness that we share. And I think it's time for our citizens of the world to wake up and to create the paradigm shift that's so, so needed because we will be ejected as a species if we don't. Extinction, yeah. extinction is normal. 99% of all species become extinct. You know, we're no, it will be no exception. And so we right. should very seriously. We, exactly, because Gaia, if you want to think of it that way, will find them. I don't worry about Gaia. Gaia life on Earth will persist. But it, it, in order to persist, it may have to call us or radically reduce our population. And that's what's happening. That's a pretty grim prospect. But on the societal level, I think you, you know, we need, and this is exactly what the McKenna Academy is about. It, it, we want to reinstitutionalize the cultural institution of, of Eleusis, you know, where this was integrated into the culture. Everyone who was anyone in, in Greek culture at that time made this pilgrimage to Eleusis. They imbibed the, uh, the Telestrion. They had an experience which they weren't supposed to talk about, but it was a transformative experience. And, uh, you know, Eleusis was the longest lived and also the most recent of the mystery schools. And they were all basically pagan. They were based on, they were matriarchal. They were based on the worship of the feminine. And they were ecstatic mystery religions involving the use of uh, plant and fungal psychedelics. We, I look forward to the day... You know, I'm very encouraged by the uh, decriminalization movements that are going on. They're kind of, you know, coming along by fits and starts. But I look forward to the day when every community can have a center that you can go to that's legal, that you can have these experiences and get other types of education, too. Like do yoga, do learn about nutrition, learn about how to take care of yourself and how to how to garden how to grow mushrooms how to you know really through action integrate or put into practice what we're always talking about which is we have to get back in harmony with nature and learn that number one nature is running things we are not number two we still have a hell of a lot to learn from nature you know one of the big messages I always get from my psychedelic experiences, whether with ayahuasca or mushrooms, is remember how little you know. You know, there's an infinite amount of things that you don't know. Even though our science is clever and we think we've nailed down a lot, most of the world, most of the universe is still a great mystery, you know, which doesn't depress me. It actually excites me because it means there's so much left to learn. You know, and uh, that's the whole idea of what we're trying to do. So, my God, I can't believe we're, you know, an hour has passed. I guess we have to go to questions, but uh, anything else that you want to say before we do that? 
Well, I, I Burning Man just got canceled, and uh, sadly, oh, that's, but, that's uh, too bad. But um, many of these uh, festivals, like Burning Man and the Envision Festival and other festivals, um, uh, Lightning in a Bottle, etc., they, they have become this magnet for all these young people. But the organizers have realized this is a time for us to help educate these people. The coming right. music, but let's add a new curriculum of education. So I want to applaud the leadership of those uh, movements because they see this as an opportunity to also pass on knowledge. So we need a new curriculum of life sciences. Uh -huh. We need to prioritize those with that which is economically rational and economically sustainable because the economy of ecology budgets nutrition for the benefit of the species that are resident within. So economics and ecology are not incompatible. They are part of the ecological systems. Right. I think we need to promote those that are ecologically rational and economically sustainable so the message can be carried on. And so I'm hoping that many of the people out there will pick, uh, take the torch and, and bravely and courageously move forward with kindness and purpose and with respect for uh, native indigenous peoples all over the world, of which we are also a member. So yes, uh, every, everyone is indigenous to Earth, right? And uh, yeah, we we have to reinvent uh, social social principles, and I think fungi and plants in general, but especially fungi, they do what they do through symbiosis, right? We have to uh, symbiosis being a mutually beneficial interaction between organisms of different species. And one of the primary examples of this is the mycorrhizal relationships that fungi have with trees in these old growth forest systems. You've written about this very beautifully uh, in many books, especially mycelium running. And, you know, one of the things that hold that hold us back, uh, you know, in terms of our advancement as a species, is this idea of competition, the old Darwinian idea, you know, that survival of the fittest. If I win, you have to lose. It doesn't work that way. Nature works through symbiosis. Nature works through collaboration. It works through forming networks and associations that rise all ships as it were or benefit all the parties we have to somehow educate uh people that capitalism is what's gotten us to this to this stage because it's based on this scarcity idea and you know taking consuming and marginalizing people we have to get past that and, and develop new social social paradigms and symbiosis provides the model for this you know, so uh, so that's what we the, the, that's what nature can teach us among everything else. Yeah. So. So let's see, um, where is our tech person? Do we probably should go to questions here? Uh, there Hi. she is. OK. Are we on schedule, Danielle, more or less? We are right on schedule. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for that incredible talk. And we are now going to bring in questions from the interconnectedness of our consciousness through the World Wide Web here. So let's start off with what was Terrence like coming up to his death and what would he say about it? Whoa. What, repeat it again, what was he like? Coming up to his death and what did he say about it? Uh, well, I, yeah. <laughs> you want to comment on that? Well, I was with him, you know, just before he died. And um, Terrence and I became good friends the last five years of his life. And he saw death as entering into the great mystery. Um, he would not be bashful in saying he was uh, concerned and afraid, but he was also uh, told me that he was excited uh, because mm -hmm. he was moving on into a different form. And he was like intellectually curious about death. And I'm going, dude, you're dying. And you're interested in the intellectualization of death. And I thought this guy is, a, is way beyond my level of being able to, to conceive. But Dennis, you being his brother, I'm sure you had deep conversations with him on that. 
Well, we we did we did have conversations about it. Of course, you know when you're dying, naturally you're afraid, or you can be afraid, and and you can also be curious. I mean, it's not unlike the way you might feel when you're about to take a high dose of a psychedelics. You know, if you don't have some butterflies in your stomach about this, you're not paying attention. On the other hand, that doesn't inhibit you. It's curiosity that drives you forward, that gives you the courage to go ahead and subject yourself to that experience because of what you might learn. And I think Terence approached his death in very much the same sort of mind frame. Well, you know, I'm dying, let's face it. There, there is no way out. In fact, I got a very strong message when I had a, a high LSD trip uh, shortly before he, in the summer before he died, and it was all about Terence. And I, you know, and the message that came to me from this was the only way out is to go in, you know. And I think Terence went into it with, with that attitude. And uh, he was at peace when he died. Uh, you know, I, I mean, he was at peace. He had accepted it. Uh, and I think he approached it in the, uh, kind of with the same attitude that he would approach psychedelics or that, that any, any good scientist, he wasn't a scientist, but he was a curious person. And I think he approached it in that spirit. This is what's happening. This is what fate has, uh, has decided for me. So let's see what happens. Of course, he hasn't reported back, as far as I know, on what happened. <laughs> I hope he's out there somewhere in, in hyperspace or whatever it is. And he's a very much part of our culture today. In and still very much part of his cult, the culture. Interestingly, he is, his voice is still very strong, and it's due to an invention which didn't exist when he passed on, which is basically YouTube. You know, and, and he's achieved this this virtual immortality on YouTube. And the things that he says, many of which are in, you know, late ninety or late late eighties and mid nineties, you know, uh, I mean they just don't seem dated at all. He he couldn't anticipate what happened, what was going to happen, but on the other hand his his ideas, his prescience, if you will, was very strong. He could see it coming and he commented. So he's very much part of the contemporary conversation for sure. Absolutely. So our next question is this is more directed at mushrooms and Paul in general. I generally take mushroom supplements for immune support. Um, many medical mushrooms have been found to have antiviral properties. Given the current pan, given the current pandemic of COVID nineteen, do you have any ideas to what which mushrooms may have the potential at combine, combating the virus and improving the immune system? Well, this is a specialty of mine: is the intersection between mushrooms and uh, viral pathogens, and I've published. Mm -hmm on this um, and it's not responsible for me to say that I have any evidence of mushrooms fighting the COVID-19 virus. Uh, it is academically supported and defensible uh, that many mushroom species, especially in the mycelial form, have shown to have profound antiviral activities by upregulating immunity and consequentially reducing uh, uh, the, the, the viral titers. So we're engaged right now in research in this very sp specific arena, um, but general immune support, good nutrition, you know, healthy environment, reducing levels, these are all cofactors that can build your immunological strength, your armamentarian uh, uh, of defenses uh, to resist uh, th things like COVID-19. However, we do not have any evidence right now uh, of mushrooms uh, being able to prevent or lessen COVID-19. We do have lots of evidence uh, of other viruses uh, where there, we have been able to show this. Um, but I would just say, stay tuned. This is a, a hyper focus of my interest right now and uh, a lot of my research. So that's, yeah. that's 
What what about other coronaviruses, Paul? Have mushrooms been tested against uh, related viruses? Well, um, yeah, well, the, the coronavirus is the common cold virus. Um, a lot of the common cold viruses are in the in the in the corona realm. Um, if people see my TED talks, my TED Med talk, my recent Stanford Medical School talks, I can I go over the research that we did with the Project BioShield uh, after 9/11. Uh, we found an old growth mushroom called agaricon that reduced uh, pox viruses, flu viruses, herpes. Um, and and th that's a weird because any virologists out there, some are DNA and the other ones are pox is DNA virus, flus are RNA viruses. And so normally you don't find a virucidal that would be ap uh, applicable against both. Well, I, indeed, I think that's correct because what it does is upregulates immunity and your immune system is able then to create uh, uh, defense mechanisms that then target the viral pathogen. So it's a much more complex. The immune field is very complex. There's a whole, about 28 different interleukins, uh, some that are associated with being antiviral, uh, but some of which are anti-inflammatory. Now, seemingly a contradiction in terms. If you have a, a immune response, usually it's pro-inflammatory. And so when you have interleukins that can excite uh, the immune system, but also are anti-inflammatory, that's new to medical science. Um, how can you potentize the immune system and yet not have inflammation? Um, that's what a lot of our research is on right now, is looking at the at least 28 different interleukins. Uh, we're very excited about some of the research we recently um, have, have concluded, and it's opening up a lot of doors of opportunity. So I would say, you know, uh, try to support your immune system as best you can. Mushrooms can be very helpful, especially polypore mushrooms. Just make sure they're certified organic. And the mycelium is far more potent in the fruit bodies. So that's where a lot of our novel research has come into play. There you have it, a report from the fungal front lines against the COVID epidemic. So keep up your good work, Paul. You're, you're doing great work. This is, this is really good. It's good to let people know about this. Thank you, Paul, for that. And um, just while we have you here, uh, there's a lot of questions around the development of your bee mushroom feeders and if they're available to the public. Yeah, we um, we made a thousand of them. Um, if you go to fungi.com slash bees, you can sign up. We uh, My intention is to give 10,000, uh, hopefully 100,000 of these away. As a citizen scientist, um, um, Invention for citizen scientists to be able to help the immunity of bees. I published an article um, in Nature Scientific Reports with my co-authors from the USDA, Washington State University. Uh, our reishi and amadou extracts, uh, reishi extract, one treatment, one percent of this extract going in from the mycelium going into sugar water, reduced the Lake Sinai virus more than forty-five thousand times in twelve days with one treatment the deformed wing virus by hundreds of times. So this is an extraordinary break, uh, uh, breakthrough. That article in, in Nature is still the, in the top 1% of all articles ever published in the Nature publication ecosystem because we're able to make the argument um, that a natural product can be more powerful than a pure pharmaceutical because it activates immunity factors. So the we because my dear good friend, uh, David Sensi, was involved in helping this um, make these, but his factory got shut down because of COVID-19. So if people sign up at a website. We're sending these out for free. We're not selling them. Um, I'll give away as many as I can afford to give away. And uh, so if you check out the website, we're developing an app. The idea is you can, people can upload information into the cloud. We can measure a pollination activity of wild bees as well as domesticated bees all over the planet. And then we have a sense of what's happening out in the ecosystem prior to crop harvest. If you know you only have 5% of normal bee activity uh, in the ecosystem, well, you can predict that pollination services are gonna be harmed and the crop failure can occur or loss of biodiversity of wild plants. So the idea is to help native bees as well as domesticated bees with these, this cute little thing. And we have some really great videos up. So. People just be patient. I can only do so much. Uh, we have a thousand of these right now in stock. Uh, we're trying to get them to thought leaders um, 
And I think there's over 26,000 people have signed up for it. And I hope to be able to give away 100,000 of them. Um, but that could cost me over a half million to a million dollars, uh, all expenses told. And I'll do as much as I can. Um, I walk my talk to the ability to, to make uh, the limits of my ability. So with people's support, we hope to get these out all over the planet. Okay, very, Amazing. very good. Thank you. Do, do you, let me just ask you a bit about the the bee protection. Is, do the, does the mycelial extract, is it antiviral or it's stimulating the immune system of the bees to resist viruses? Is yeah, that well, your it's called, it's current thinking? Mode. It's called the mode of action, and we're trying to define that okay. right now. One of the interesting things that we found, one of my colleagues and the co-author on our paper uh, discovered that our extracts uh, almost exactly fingerprint profile the mineral concentrations in pollen. Um, and it turns okay. out that there are pollination deserts now because of uh, factory farming and monoculture. So rather than having all these diverse plants producing pollen at different weeks, you have a factory farm monoculture of one crop, all producing pollen within a week or two. And then they, then right. they have a pollination desert. And so they, they get immune stress because of lack of nutrition. So we know that they're immunologically challenged due to pollination deserts and lack of being able to get these natural forms. My discovery shows that bees go to rotted logs because of mycelium and because of immune benefit. We don't know the mode of action. But the fact is there's no antiviral reducing viruses in bees until our discovery, none. And the the effects that we're seeing that, that are helping to reduce the virus in, in, innately um, is, is so profound. If you went to a doctor, you had HIV in the next week or 12 days later, they said you have 45,000 times less HIV than you had 12 days ago. The doctors would say, this is, you're going astonishingly well. We don't understand the mode of action. We think it's a very complex series of ingredients that are intersecting immunologically with the bees, and this is yet to be determined. But there's a phrase by Voltaire that I very much like, and I'd like for people to really take this home. Voltaire, you know, the French philosopher, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm, indeed. Who cares how it, the mechanism of action, the fact that bees are living longer, they, bees used to fly for nine days. Now they're flying for four or five days, honeybees. They used to, they will pollinate a thousand flowers a day. Pollination services have been cut in half in the past 30 years. So let's not get lost in the weeds, so to speak, about the mechanism of action where we can see the results. So this yeah, is the, exactly. This it, is the, the point that, is they work, right? The problem with the regulatory environment and people get hung up and making the arguments about the mechanism of action, they lose the see the, they can't see the forest for the trees. You know, so right. let's, right. not, let's not the perfect be the enemy of the good. The fact is that these things work. Right. And also, as you said, now this is a consequence. This is one of the unanticipated consequences we're seeing because of the sacrifice of biodiversity. You know, so this is all very much relevant to what we're doing factory farming all these unsustainable petroleum-based agricultural systems this is what happens when you when you sacrifice biodiversity and you know, this, this, I mean, COVID-19 uh, the one the prevailing theory is this because of the intersection of the loss of biodiversity and forests with with human activity encroaching upon those ecosystems and stressing the immunity of those animals in their ecosystem Zoonotic diseases mean diseases that come from animals. And uh, many of these pathogens that we have been exposed to uh, ha are incubated in stressed animal populations that are suffering, you know, uh, from all the obvious stressors that we're inflicting upon them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, very good. So we have a definitely a psychedelic crowd here and there's a lot of votes on a question around when was the last time either of you took a significant journey on psychedelics and is it still something you do on a regular basis? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in some way, all journeys on psychedelics are significant, you know, even if they don't have the outcome that you anticipated. So, 
you know, sometimes they're incredible revelations, sometimes not so much, but they always seem to be useful. Um, as far as the last time I took a significant amount of psychedelic, for a long time I've been taking ayahuasca more regularly than mushrooms. I have to get back to it. Uh, and I, I have more recently. I can't put my finger on the last time. I, I can put my finger on the last time. <laughs> Okay, long. good. <laughs> you admit to federal felonies in front of 6,000 people. I'm not telling you the date and I'm not telling you the country, okay? Um, okay. <laughs> and my answer would be um, not enough. So, um, but, you know, um, you know, there's uh, the common phrase, Alan Watts, and then, then Terrence used it, you know, when you pick up the phone and get the message and you know, hang it up. Um, Nevertheless, the last time I did uh, mushrooms, I th immediately thought to myself, why am I not doing these more often? Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. set setting is really, really important. Um, so having the, the, the um, convergence of the calamity of, of just day-to-day -day life, just carving out the space and the time is really, really important. Um, so I honor the question um, for legal reasons I can't specifically answer. Um, but my official answer is, is not enough. Okay. Not enough. Yes, I agree. I mean, we're all, like you say, we're, we're pretty super busy people, you know, so it is hard to carve out the time and it's important to make that special time. You could even call it a sacred space and time in which to do these things and it's not the frequency or the you know it's not the frequency that you do that counts it's the quality of your experience you know and and one of the things that sets psychedelics aside is that for many people who take them for therapeutic purposes or spiritual explorations or whatever I mean, they may only do it a few times in a lifetime you know but they get what they need from it. Now, if you want to sell, if you're a company that wants to commercialize psilocybin, this isn't good news because, you know, you, you can't, you can't commodify the drugs because, you know, people use, their, their use should be rare and special is, is kind of what I think. Optimize the conditions for having the experience and don't, don't worry about, you know, just because I've take an ayahuasca a thousand times or whatever. Paul's probably taken mushrooms at least that many times. It doesn't matter. You know, what matters is the experiences that you have are good, you know, and you approach them thoughtfully, respectfully, and you try to optimize the quality of the experience. That's, that's the more important thing, I think. And these are special times where we need to have sacred experiences. So, uh, I think yeah. uh, all of us being isolated, all of us reprioritizing our values and, and the importance of our families and our lovers and our friendships, you know, this is an opportune time for us to really reevaluate who we are and what our purpose is in life. And we all will, we all will die, uh, breaking news. Um, and so <laughs> it's important that we face our own mortality with dignity and respect. And the, the de decriminalization uh, of psychedelics movements, I applaud them. And my mother recently died. Before my father died, he asked to trip with me on, on psilocybin mushrooms. Um, I turned him down. I have a lot of regrets about that. But he was um, very religious, and I was so concerned I'd rattle his tree. It would change his whole view of reality. He would suddenly be aware of what he had been missing. And mm -hmm. I didn't to have that feeling of loss at the end of his life that suddenly going, oh my God, now I understand. Um, it's a, it was a too much of a responsibility. So I, I sort of chickened out, frankly. Um, now yeah. I, I would have had more courage to say that this would have been really beneficial for him. We all have a right to the, how we die. Who is going to tell me and what government's going to tell me I don't have a right to take a psychedelic you know, on my deathbed? Really? Right. You want to put me in jail? After I die, go ahead. You know, my body will sit in jail. It makes no sense. It becomes absurd when there's, there's laws outlying your basic human right to your own consciousness. 
Yes, I think it is a basic human right. And, and you know, lately I've been talking about the right to symbiosis. You know, we should proclaim as a basic, not just human right, but organismic right, that people have the right to form symbiotic relationships with any plant or fungus or other organism that they want to. You know, and I think that that's how you address the legal, the very idea that you can criminalize something like psilocybin mushrooms or ayahuasca is absurd. And it's a reflection of this incredible arrogance that we have toward nature, you know, and nature has just slapped us in the face and said, wait a minute, you need to remember a few things. Number one, you're not running the show, monkeys. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so uh, this is this is a way to start. This is a way to start. But that should be respected just as we would, would should be uh, ready to respect people's choices when they when they are ready to pass on if they want to take a psychedelic that should be available to them if they want medically assisted euthanasia i believe they should have that right too you know i mean the important thing is to you know death is right up there one of the three most important things that you do four most important things you do in life one of them is dying the other one, of course, is is being born, and taking a psychedelic. I would put that among the the four main things. The other one is making love. You know, a person should make love at least once in their life, and hopefully many times, because this is an important expression of what it is to be human. So those four things. And the government regulators should keep their hands off of these things. These are sacred aspects of human existence and should not be prohibited or legally regulated in any way, in my opinion. Get it on the and soapbox, it's sorry. A, <laughs> it's truly a, a birthright to have a healthy relationship with nature. Yeah. So uh, I'd love to, we have about time for one more question here. And um, the audience is wondering if Paul or Dennis could both elaborate on certain places around the world that are best for travel to seek growth with psychedelics. Um, and for those of us who wish to further career options and ways to help the psychedelic cause, what options would you recommend to either academically or a program for us to start that path? It's not a complicated, it's not a simple question. There are many layers to this. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, the issue about tourism and going to indigenous people, indigenous places and taking something like ayahuasca, it's a complicated matter, you know, because that has positive and negative aspects to it. And I think maybe this is going, the coronavirus and what it's doing to travel is going to change that. You know, I would prefer what we were talking about a little while ago about having centers in every community that one could go to so that people don't have to travel to get these experiences. They don't have to have the impact on these indigenous cultures that tourism produces. And I mean, I'm guilty. I, I organize retreats for ayahuasca and that sort of thing. What I would prefer is to see be able to do this legally and out of the shadows in every community and bring the medicine to the people. Don't take the people to the medicine. Let the people in these indigenous communities produce it, export it legally, give, make that accessible you know, uh, to people. Um, as far as what you do, if you want to get involved in psychedelic work and research, I mean, you don't really need me to tell you. People are finding their own way. Some choose science, some choose anthropology, some choose medicine, other approaches to it. There's plenty of resources out there, you know, especially more than ever. The psychedelic societies, uh, you know, uh, Facebook groups and so on. There's plenty of ways to find uh, find your place in the in the in the psychosphere or the psychedelical sphere, if that's if that's what you want to call it, you know, there there are ways to find 
And you just, I, I think you just have to follow your intuition and, and it will, you know, trust your intuition and you'll find your way. It's my feeling. Yeah, I'll add that the California Institute for Integral Studies in San Francisco uh, have mm -hmm. a, a program specifically training psychedelic therapists. They're also a very good clearinghouse of referrals. Uh, there's MAPS uh, US, MAPS.org. There's also MAPS Canada, uh, the multi Multidisciplinary Association for, Dis for Psychedelic Studies uh, by Rick Doblin, um, who's running the one in in the U.S. and Mark uh, Hayden, who's, who's in Canada. There's a new Canadian Psychedelic Association just formed. Oh. Um, but we're seeing this uh, happening all over the world. Um, so anyone, and no matter where you are, um, consider uh, you know uh, replicating the successes and following the models that have been tried and true and uh, still evolving. But many of these organizations have a really good track record by, right now and responsibly using and teaching and also interfacing with the government and to, in order to make sure that there's harm reduction and maximum benefit uh, and that these substances are not abused. Yeah, I mean, that that's exactly right. I do wanna put in a plug for Hefter, Hefter Research Institute, hefter.org. We're similar to MAPS, except nobody's ever heard of us, uh, or fewer people, because we're, we're not good publicists. But Hefter has, uh, in terms of the research front, they've really contributed substantially to advancing the, the psilocybin research and the acceptance of psilocybin as a, as a medicine. So they're, they're also on the cutting edge. But as Paul says, you can you can tap into these communities of interest you can find it there's lots of ways so i would say you know follow i mean what excites you go for that and then connect with the people i, I and i i don't i don't think you can separate uh doing environmental research re restoration research uh biodiversity research all of these things they may not directly have to do with psychedelics but they're very important oh, you know absolutely. and, and they, they are relevant so anyone that chooses to work in the life sciences uh you know especially on the well both medicine and the what you might call natural history or whatever. I mean, absolutely encourage that, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have spoken with graduate students at UBC who are in botany, who have never looked at a plant, you know, and this is a problem. I mean, they're looking at test tubes, they're running DNA gels, they're doing all this kind of thing. Do you ever go out into the forest and, and communicate with plants i think it i think having this organismic perspective is very important sure the molecular stuff is important too that's not the uh, that's not the whole story by any means so i encourage that yeah thank you there are many ways to get involved in the psychedelic community and many psychedelic societies out there to support people as a real access point and nexus center uh, so we have uh, kind of a heady question here um, about microdosing with lion's mane, if there's any studies on neurogenesis and um, the effects in the rest of the central nervous system. For, exa for example, regeneration of optic nerves and on the other side of the spore with the larger doses, many people experience the voice or some type of entity. In your opinions, is, it, is this an external or internal creation? or if Gaia hypothesis an accurate collective unconscious, perhaps it is both. Well, that's a two part question. I can take the first part, but yeah. Dennis, I want you to take the second part. <laughs> I'm, not gonna... <laughs> I'm not going there, Paul, but the first part, you can answer the first part. Yeah, yeah. We, again, with the psilocybin analog, the legal ones, we've been doing comparison with lion's mane uh, extracts, both the mycelium and the proof bodies. And the mycelium has found to be profound in causing neurogenesis. Uh, the credit for this goes with a uh, Japanese scientist by the name of Kawagishi, um, who um, first uh, I became aware of it from a patent he filed in 1994, not long since expired. Um, and there's two clinical studies showing improvement with mild cognitive decline in pre-Alzheimer's-like patients. Our work has continued Kawagishi's work, and uh, we are very robust models at multiple universities 
showing synergism, you'll like this, symbiosis between the psilocybin analogs and lion's mane, where coupling them together it has far more profound neurogen neurogenesis benefits. This is neurite outgrowth as well as remyelination of the myelin on the axons of nerves that allow for neurotransmission. So the proliferation of new nerve endings leads to new synapses. I think lots more integration neurologically, and we think it, it has a better mental state, you know, improvement. Um, there's a great app uh, that's been developed. It's at microdose.me, uh, M-I-C-O-R-O, dos.me, and you can log in, it's anonymized, and you can actually do microdosing, and there's all sorts of uh, uh, visual acuity tests, hearing tests, uh, tap tests, uh, for to uh, basically calculate your neurological state of being progressively over time, because we do decline as we get older, hard for me to admit, um, but microdosing, I think, has the enormous potential. A microdose is defined as being sub-threshold from you being able to feel it, Lion's men you don't feel, but these other psilocybin and other compounds, you're taking a microdose that does not have any noticeable effect in the change of your consciousness. But some of the research has shown that microdosing is more powerful uh, neurogenically than a single dose. And I think that's because cells need to regrow. And so you're uh -huh. microdosing, you're regenerating new cells. And one massive dose, sure, you're getting the experience, you'll get that stimulus, but then it goes out of your system pretty quickly. So the idea of microdosing is like a nootropic vitamin to be able to help you know, your mental health and, and your cognition due to improvement of your, of, of your neurological systems. But Dennis, I'd love to hear you describe the, the voice and the entity part of that question. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm not going to go there. It's it's uh, it's a can of worms, and I I don't want to get into it, or we'll never get out of here. Um, <laughs> I would like to mention, though, I think there is a uh, something people should write down. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Just uh, that's a website that lists all FDA approved clinical trials that are going on for anything. I mean, that doesn't have to be about psychedelics, but if you go to clinical trials, all one word, dot gov, and search on psilocybin, you will see that the trials that are underway, that are anticipated, or that have been recently completed for different therapeutic uh, targets. I believe there's one in process now that is a clinical trial for psilocybin for people with cognitive deficit, you know, essentially pre-Alzheimer's people who are losing cognitive function. And that that's a trial that you could you could look that up and, and apply for it or or apply for on behalf of someone you love. I think that trial is uh, in progress right now. There, there, so there, these things excuse me? There's more than 20 universities right now that are currently uh, conducting clinical uh, trials with psilocybin approved uh, by the, the, the respective governments in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Also, the website yeah. that, that I populate is unbranded, it's not commercial, it's mushroomreferences.com. Uh, this morning before this interview, I was reading 100 Google Scholar alerts, you know, and go through them. And I curate this with one of my employees. And mushroomreferences.com, I write it for physicians and researchers. Um, it's got like 50 articles on psilocybin, peer-reviewed peer journal articles, et cetera. But go to mushroomreferences.com. I update it about once a month. Um, but it's several hundred pages long now that's curated specifically to help people look up things on lion's mane, look up things on dementia, psilocybin, et cetera. So, right. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with the site and it is, it's a great resource. It's, it's a wonderful resource for this. So yeah, thank you. Well, thank you both so much for this incredible talk. And, you know, we're really creating a worldwide movement to propel us into the future here. So, Paul, where can the audience find you if they're new? Well, um, my personal website is paulstamets.com. And that's where you can find me. Um, yeah. But that's the best place for you to find what I've been up to and what I'm doing. Paulstamets.com. It's kind of sure. Sure. It kind of has a Star Trek theme. I'm kind of a Star Trek guy. Nice. 
Yes, that's right. You the, the, There's a character in the more recent Star Trek that is, I think, modeled after you and his name is Stamets, right? Yeah, he's okay. the he's the uh he's the ship he's the expedition mycologist for Star Trek. Yeah. So I, yeah. <laughs> I, work with, I work with the writers uh, of Star Trek and uh, had him on the phone for about 2 hours and gave him the overall theme that became the the Star Trek Discovery series. Anthony Rapp plays astromycologist Paul Stamets. Um, and astral mycology. Now there's there's a career, <laughs> a future after, career. <laughs> uh, yesterday, NASA reached out to me again. I, I went down and visited them at the Ames Research Center, and um, and so the idea of uh, growing mycelium for buildings and for creating habitats, um, you know, on Mars and elsewhere, is something that they're very interested in. So um, never underestimate the power of fungi. Absolutely. Right. Right. And Dennis, where can the audience find you? Well, they can find me at the McKenna Academy. Probably easiest uh, way to reach me is just Dennis at McKenna dot Academy. Modern day mystery. Find school. it through the uh, website as well. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, thank you both so much for this talk and I hope that we can continue to stay connected and honoring the, the life of Terrence and his legacy. So we're going to move into our breakout groups section and we'll be back here at 220. Okay. Right. Thanks, Paul. This was, Thank you. this was Thank wonderful. You, Thank you. All right. This is one for the books. If we still had books. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks so much for, for joining us. This has been really fantastic fantastic right. like the fungi <laughs> we didn't even get a chance to talk about this but if anybody has a chance look at this movie it's out there i think it's still it's pretty much open access right now i think i read it for four dollars and 99 cents which is less than a double shot of espresso so yeah you know. best four bucks you've ever spent this yeah. is it's really a beautiful a beautiful uh piece of cinematography it's very inspiring you know, so thanks again. Um, I guess and we're going thanks. to the breakout session and then we'll be back here at 2.20. 2.20. All right. I'll take and a, a little big thank break. You to our audience. may pop into one of those breakout sessions or not, but okay. okay. Back to work. Thank you. Be kind, be courageous. Okay. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Bye-bye. And big thank you to our audience, all 6,089 of you. Thank you so much for being here and part of this experience. Don't leave, we have a lot more programming in store for you. And um, I'm gonna walk us through the next portion now. We're gonna move into our breakout groups where you can dive deeper into the talks and to the thought provoking material of the talks. And each one of the breakout groups is moderated by uh, the San Francisco Psychedelic Society team. So if you are new to Crowdcast, let me just guide you through this. So imagine we're in a house right now and the house we're in, we're in the theater and we just saw the, the main, we were just on the main stage and now we're gonna break out into different rooms into the house. Um, so, all right. So basically you are going to um, go to the top of your screen where you see uh, the name of the talk, the Paul Stamets Fireside Chat, and where it says more, dot, 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 click on more, dot, 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 and there you'll have a drop down menu where you can um, choose a different breakout group. And feel free to go between um, in and out of each group. If you find a group that you really like, we encourage you to stay there. Um, so pick the group of your choice. And um, be patient as you're going into the breakout group, because sometimes it takes a minute for this platform to um, host all these people and um, break them out into different rooms. If you're on mobile, the session is at the top of your screen. So just pull it down from the top of the screen. And um, once you enter into the breakout group of your choice, 
type, type something in the chat because the facilitator doesn't know that you're there. So it's helpful for the facilitator to know if you're in the chat room. And also if you are wanting to go up on screen and ask a question or interact with the group, uh, just be sure to uh, test your mic and your camera so that it's working. And sometimes it doesn't work, so you just have to reload your page and feel free to ask questions as well. And there's a really supportive community here, so I'm sure people can help you out in the group. And um, also type in to the chat box to raise your hand so that the facilitator knows that you're in there. Um, so we are gonna be back here at 2.20 and we're gonna hear from um, Dennis again and um, Dr. Bruce Damer and come back here at 2.20. So thank you all so much for being here. And um, if you can't find the breakouts on your iPhone, you go from the top of the screen down. Dr. Wade Davis at 2.20. So I will see you back here then. Thank you.